Christians are hearing an argument which says, oh, if only you'd read the Greek, or if only you'd read the Hebrew, or if only you knew about the cultural context. And actually, when you dig into any of these things, you find, no, once I know the Greek, once I know the Hebrew, once I know the cultural context, it's still saying what it looks like it's saying. Welcome to the Sessor Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name's Daniel Yang, National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief, and today we're talking with Dr. Rebecca McLaughlin. Rebecca's former Vice President of Content at Veritas Forum, where she spent almost a decade working with Christian academics at leading secular universities. She's the author of several books, including Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion, her latest is, Does the Bible Affirm Same-Sex Relationships? Examining 10 Claims About Scripture and Sexuality. But first, let's go to Ed Stetzer, Editor-in-Chief of Outreach Magazine and the Dean of Talbot School of Theology. So we're just going to jump right into the conversation with Rebecca. And, um, you know, I remember I was on a panel, I don't know, 15 years ago. And um, it was uh, one, two, three, four of us. And there was um, the whole conversation got a little got a little animated, and one of the people on the panel said, "You know, I just think that uh, that soon uh, same sex relationship and our view of sexuality uh, will become an agree to disagree issue among Christians, like in many ways, um, you know, ish, modes of baptism or or you know how we view uh, egalitarian complementarian conversations across denominations that that would be in that category. So I just want to start with that question for you: um, Can Christians just agree to disagree? And I, maybe I should caveat that and say, can uh, can evangelical Christians, um, you know, and certain people with their view of the scriptures and more. So, but can Christians just agree to disagree on this topic? No. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll say more. <laughs> yeah. No, please, please do um, say more. Yeah. The, the reason, and I actually had this conversation recently with um, a friend who was in, min in a ministry context and in a college ministry context was trying to navigate the fact that a lot of the students he was working with uh, were either in a kind of affirming of same-sex marriage position or unclear. And the way that he'd been navigating this was essentially allowing it to be functionally an agree to disagree issue. And I said, here's one of the, the problems with that approach is that the question of whether same-sex sexual relationships are or are not sinful is one that, you know, the rubber hits the road if you, like me, are somebody who is attracted to people of their same sex. Because it then becomes a question not just of sort of theory, but a question that could actually make a pretty major difference in your life. Because I, I think we can all agree that the New Testament takes sexual sin exceedingly seriously, that Jesus himself takes sexual sin exceedingly seriously, and, and if anything, kind of tightens up the Old Testament law rather than relaxing it. You know, famously, you have heard that it was said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, don't even look at a woman with lustful intent. And then you know, rolling right from that to if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out because it's better to enter the kingdom of God without an eye than it is to to not. So, so the the seriousness with which the New Testament takes sexual sin is so high that if we cannot agree on what sexual sin is or isn't, or, or if we think it's sort of unclear from the scriptures, like this, this is an incredibly high stakes. This is a life or death uh, kind of situation, not a agree to disagree sort of scenario um it, it seems to me as somebody who honestly you know one stage of my life i'd have been more than happy to figure out a way to read the bible that did allow for same-sex marriage i didn't kind of come to the bible hoping that it would say no because i would have been more than happy to to pursue that path myself if i'd felt like that was an option the more i've studied the scriptures the more convinced i am that there is just a very clear no to same-sex sexual relationships but i feel like i've come to a better understanding both of the sort of gospel centered why to that and of the gospel centered call that we all have to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. So I actually, I, I, I've come to a point not of feeling kind of resentful or frustrated that there is a clear no in the Bible to something which I, you know, in my flesh would have been more than happy to, to pursue, but actually feel like I'm kind of at least grasping the edges of quite how beautiful God's vision for marriage is and quite how beautiful God's vision for brotherly and sisterly love between believers is and how those are actually sort of different ways 
that we touch the edges of God's love for us? It was a long answer to your question. No, no, but, it's, but it's, I think it's, a, it's worthy of a long answer. I think this is the, uh, perhaps one of the most important issues of our day. You said it's a life or death issue. That's strong language. How is it a life or death issue? In two senses. One, for those who um, feel a, a deep desire and, and for some a sort of abiding desire for a same-sex romantic or sexual partnership, the question of whether the Bible says yes to that or says no to that is is a question that will then meaningfully shape their life. The, the even more important kind of life or death dimension to that is if this is something, which in my understanding of what Paul says in in First Corinthians six, you know, he says, "Don't you realize that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God?" And then he lists a, a whole bunch of sinful practices, which if you kind of walking unrepentantly in those sins, you're walking yourself out of the kingdom of God. And one of those is um, men who sleep with males. Um, and then he says, and this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So if I'm understanding Paul correctly, and I I, I don't see particularly another way to, to understand him, this is unrepentant sexual sin is actually walking you out of the kingdom of God. Like this is a, this is an eternal life level conversation that we're having. Um, and so it is profoundly unloving to say to somebody who is a follower of Jesus and who is drawn to sexual and romantic relationships with their same sex. They're like, well, maybe that's okay because actually, no, this is, this is something that is, uh, uh, we're walking ourselves out of the kingdom of God if we're unrepentant in, in the area of sexual sin. And um, you've indicated a couple times you talked about same-sex attraction. Do you uh, identify as a lesbian, gay, or some other term in and around that? And why or why not would you identify? Because that is an issue that you're aware of. Maybe not all of our listeners are aware of, of how you identify that. Yeah, I think the Bible is exceedingly clear on how we should and shouldn't, shouldn't use our bodies when it comes to same-sex sexual relationships. I think how we then describe our experience or our patterns of temptation or however you, you know, we could kind of talk through different ways of, of thinking about that is not a question on which the Bible is like so crystal clear that I would want to call somebody a heretic who came to a different view from me. I think it's more in the territory of of wisdom. So I would not refer to myself as gay or lesbian, even though, you know, as I sometimes said, if somebody kind of took a a video reel of my internal life, what's the best way to put this? I've been happily married to my husband for the last sort of 17 years. Anytime I've been attracted to somebody outside of my marriage, it's always been to a woman. Um, so on one diagnostic test, you could say, well, you know, it seems you know, reasonably evident that this is somebody who is um, strongly, primarily same-sex attracted. Uh, if fun fact or, or kind of interesting data point, about 16% of women experience some degree of same-sex attraction and about 7% of men do, but only 1% of women and 2% of men are exclusively attracted to people of their same sex. So... Whereas I might seem like a kind of strange outlier as a woman who's happily married to a man, but is someone who is, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've always been primarily attracted to women. I'm not actually that atypical. Um, the reason I, I don't find it helpful to refer to myself with either the sort of label lesbian or, or gay is a couple of things. One is that I think most people in our culture would understand both those words to refer to not only a pattern of attractions, but actually also a um, a sort of living into those attractions. So, you know, some people say, well, I, I call myself a gay Christian, but I'm, I'm always ready to explain what I do and don't mean by that. I understand that. I think the other piece is that because in our culture, the labels gay and lesbian and all, all, all sort of labels around sexuality and gender have become very much identity markers. I think there is meaningful risk or, or lack of wisdom um, for Christians to be taking one of those sort of identity markers to themselves, because I think it, it can um, imply it like a level of 
identification with with something which at the end of the day is a is a sinful desire in my heart um now i i could say you know i think of a friend of mine who's an alcoholic and went through alcoholics anonymous and so is used to saying hi i'm so my name's so and so and i'm an alcoholic like you could say well an alcoholic might identify themselves as an alcoholic without saying this is a good thing that's that's true i think often when um we identify ourselves with a, a label like gay or lesbian or bisexual or whatever the implication in our culture is that we're saying like this is a good thing right. um so those are those are reasons why i wouldn't want to lo- use any of that language of myself though at the same time I, I do want to hold space for people who um thoroughly agree with me on what the bible teaches when it comes to same-sex sexual relationships but feel like that language describes their experience and makes most sense to the people around them even though they have to do a bunch of explaining work to say what they do and don't mean yeah but it is interesting how like i started and i asked is this agree to disagree and you were very clear no yes. and but now as we talk about how maybe identification it's it's no but i hold some space for that so and i think this right. is a lot of people aren't aware that this is part of the big conversation that's going on right now is how best do we navigate, even among those who we would call orthodox on issues of sexuality, how best do we navigate how we articulate this? How do we help people to deal with their same-sex attraction um, you know, and, and more? Uh, and so this is sort of blown up into the public sphere. Um, we, see, uh, we see crew has been uh, in, in, talked about and online in the news and more as they're trying to kind of navigate some of that. So what's your posture in general? I mean, we talked about crew, but and, and feel free to, but what's our posture in general? Do you think our posture in general should be towards people who, like you said, hold and share that view, uh, but are also maybe uh, taking different approaches to, to best navigate it? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so crew is actually a great example here because um, our brothers and sisters who are working in campus ministry are in a context where they are trying to uphold clear Christian orthodoxy and also, you know, especially for a, a campus ministry like crew that isn't sort of denominationally um, fixed. So it's not like, you know, Reform University Fellowship, for example, it doesn't have, uh, its confessional statement is, is one that is not tied to a particular kind of denominational view. And so crew holds space for people who take a range of views on on a number of issues, um, <clears throat> you know, whether it's sort of baptism or, you know, a whole, a whole range of different different things and when it comes to the questions around sexual ethics and, and same-sex sexual relationships in particular um crew's done drawn a, a very clear um orthodox and to my mind um bold in the best sense stand when it comes to same-sex sexual yeah, and, I, and i would say relationships in some settings for them as well yeah exceedingly costly uh, i mean any campus ministry that's willing to um put a, a stake in the ground and say we do not affirm same-sex sexual relationships under any circumstances is asking to be thrown off campus often um you know there's a there's a real kind of cost cost there um i think crew has done actually a really good job of saying to its ministry staff you know who who are missionaries in a particular kind of ministry context um we recognize that people are going to take different views on exactly how they they want to a- a- approach students and how um, how they might want to use language or not use language. There are going to be con- conscience issues there. Um, and yeah, I feel like it, contrary to some of the claims that are being made about Crew's lack of orthodoxy, I actually f- find Crew's position to be extremely orthodox and, and quite helpful um, in you know, difficult circumstances because yeah. you're talking about a large organization that's working on a whole range of campuses and on all, all sorts of other contexts as well, but trying to, um, you know, be clear and faithful when it comes to what the Bible teaches um, and also holding space for people to not to not to teach anything that's not aligned with that, but to um, have conversations around language and around, um, you know, precisely how do we relate to those with whom we might disagree, for instance. And I want to, um, I got, I want to go through some of the ten claims in particular. Does the Bible affirm same sex? The book title is "Does the Bible Affirm Same Sex Relations?" Relationships affirm, examining ten claims about scripture and sexuality. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask about uh, Richard Hayes and about mm. the, uh, you know, shift that we actually saw just just recently, 
published. Now, we don't know all the details of it because the book's not out as well, but the moral vision has been something that a lot of us have quoted over the years. Uh, uh, one person said that, you know, this this was the one scholar that conservative people like us could point to, and now that scholar's changed his mind. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I've only, <clears throat> like any of us, I think at this point, read the, the blurb <clears throat> published by um, yeah, University Press about the book. But I found it exceedingly disappointing. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I had a frog in my throat here. Uh, one of the ways in which I found it disappointing is that it, the language of the widening of, of God's mercy um, and even the the sort of first line of, of the blurb, I'll read out here, a fresh, deeply biblical account of God's expanding grace and mercy, developing a theological framework for the full inclusion of LGBTQ people in Christian communities. <clears throat> I'm part of a community group here up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I go to a little Southern Baptist church here. We have a Bible study group that meets every Tuesday night. And several, like many, in fact, at this point of my friends and the people I'm discipling and, and ministering to and being encouraged by are people who, were they not Christians, would be identifying as LGBT. Um, or people who previously identified as LGBT and have now become Christians. You know, for example, one young woman who literally has um, tattoos of naked women on her body from the period when she was identifying as a lesbian and exclusively dating women who became a Christian just last year, got baptized in December. Um, there is no question as to whether people who identify as LGBT are have access to God's mercy. All of us do. And anyone is, is, it has the offer of Jesus um, made to them where they can repent and believe and put their trust in him. But none of us get to come to Jesus without repentance. And none of us get to say, do you know what? Um, well, let me put it the other way. <clears throat> Any of us who repent and believe and put our trust in Jesus must then recognize that he is our Lord and that he has the right to tell us what to do. He has the right to tell us what to do with our bodies. He has the right to tell us to deny ourselves. Um, he has the right uh, to tell us to, to not fulfill our sexual dreams and romantic uh, desires. He has all of that right over us. And so, so even the positioning of um, those who, like me, hold to... Uh, orthodoxy when it comes to same-sex sexual relationships the positioning of, of that as like somehow keeping people out of the realm of access to god's mercy i find um frustrating yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. put it that way and then some of the the other language and again i mean i don't i don't want to judge a book by its cover or just by its blurb and i look forward to reading the book to, to be fair, it, it, it is more than the cover. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's it, they're articulating some, uh, there's a change of mind. So. Yes. Um, and some of the language around, um, you know, they remind us of a dynamic and gracious God who is willing to change his mind, consistently broadening his grace to include more and more people. I've read the Bible cover to cover and I have not found a God who is changing his mind. Hmm. You know, like I... I <laughs> At a basic theological level, I find some of these claims to yeah, be. I, I found that interesting. I thought that they, there might be a couple of places where they said the person prayed and God, you know, responded. And I, I'm trying to figure out what. Yeah, but but again, it's a little bit hard to tell from from the blurbs that we have. Yeah, so it, it, I think um, when when we get to the point of saying actually we're going to figure out a way to read the Bible that doesn't say no to same-sex sexual relationships, we will tend to find ourselves in all sorts of other theological messes, for yeah. want of a better word. Um, and at least from what I can tell from the blurb, like this is, there's going to be some, a, a, a whole bunch of theological mess here. Yeah, it was, it was, um, of course that made a, uh, this was in early April, made a big, Big, big news, and and I think more to come as the when the the book is read and more, but but I do think I, I wanted to hear your a bit of your reaction. It, it kind of in some ways reminds me of uh, of um, when Sam Albury responded to Andy Stanley's in, in Christianity Today um, that you know, I mean I, I'm I'm my 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 journey is you know I'm I'm you're you're experiencing inclusion, you're experiencing the community that's there, and others are there as well, and. 
And, uh, and you're doing so, I would say, at a way that reflects a, uh, a personal cost. And let me just say, uh, maybe on, on behalf of evangelicalism, I'm thankful that you have maintained a biblical view of orthodoxy when there's a personal cost that's there. Uh, and and it, it, it does certainly um, close closes conversations, closes doors, and um, and has cost you personally. So, so that's why I think one of the reasons why I when you, I knew when I heard you had a new book coming out. Again, the book is "Does the Bible Affirm Same Sex Relationships?" Examining ten claims about scripture and sexuality. Uh, your book confronting Christianity, sort of, you know, just everyone was talking about that. We had you speak at the Amplify Conference, and I was there at Wheaton and others, and I know you're just back there as well. Um, so, so with these. Uh, realities that are there. Let's talk some about those claims. Um, mm -hmm. um, the you talked about ten claims in your book. Most of them come across. What, how do you count? What are the most? What are the most common ones? And how do you kind of counter some of them? Yeah, I tried in the book to address what seemed to me to be the most common claims. Now it may be that there was an eleventh one that was more common and popular than the ones that, that I addressed. I, I didn't do like a kind of scientific study of um, exactly what, what people are saying. Um, but what I tried to do is to take each claim um, seriously, because many of these claims actually, at first glance, sound quite persuasive and compelling. So I wanted to kind of look carefully at the claim that was being made. And then to explain why, actually, if we look in um, a bit more detail, we will see that this claim doesn't hold up. Um, now, the one exception to this, I guess you could say, is I have an early chapter that's looking at um, God's judgment on Sodom. And that um, passage in Genesis is often referred to by Christians as like clear proof that God does not affirm same-sex marriage. And I actually think the way that it's been wielded by Christians if that was the only evidence that we had from the Bible, I don't think it makes that case. Now, I think it's not inconsistent with the evidence of, of the rest of the Bible. So I'm not saying it like has nothing to contribute to this conversation. Um, but the situation in Sodom is a situation of sort of the attempted gang rape of these two men who are in fact angels. But like the, nobody on any side of this conversation is saying that um, clearly God affirms gang rape like that right, um sure. so so that's a that's a claim which i think has um you know when people say actually you're illegitimately applying the story of sodom to the question of same-sex marriage for christians today i think there's an extent to which it is an illegit illegitimate application and interestingly when jesus talks about the story of sodom his application of it is not um therefore don't have same-sex sex his application of it is um if the people of Sodom had had the kind of access to me that you guys have had in my teaching, they would have repented. So it's going to be worse for you on, on judgment day than it is than it was for the people of Sodom. Sort of <laughs> startling, really. I mean, yeah. there's um, the more I read through and, and the more I kind of looked at all of the different passages in the Bible that do um, speak to this issue, the more clear I've become on God's... Um, the seriousness of God's judgment and the beauty of the gospel. And that actually any of us who are entering the, into these conversations from a posture of sort of superiority um, and looking, looking down on those sort of sinners over there, uh, we're not reading the passages carefully. Um, you know, even for example, Ro Paul in, in Romans one, when he um, clearly portrays both male, male and female, female sexual relationships as, as sinful. Um, then at the beginning of chapter two, kind of slaps you in the face if you're somebody who was sort of reading this from a self-righteous perspective. So I think we have the the gospel baked in all around all of these passages. Um, and we we end up kind of robbing the gospel of its power if we're trying to just um, position what the Bible clearly says is sin as not sin. You know, the, the gospel is about the forgiveness of sins, not about <clears throat> um, us sort of trying to reinterpret things that God says are sinful as, as not sinful. Um, I think one of, the, one of the areas which I found particularly interesting was looking at how the, the word that Paul uses in a couple of places um, to describe men who sleep with other men um, is a word that he's essentially coined based on 
the Greek translation of the verse in Leviticus 18, where um, the law says that a, a, a man must not sleep with another male. And it's sort of just interesting to see the connective tissue between the Old Testament and the, and the New um, on that point. And, and some of the ways in which I think affirming arguments try to say, well, we, we can't really know what Paul was meaning there. I'm thinking... It's actually really hard to sort of look at this carefully in the in the Greek and not to know what Paul is meaning there. Um, or when people say, well, the Bible's only really talking about um, unequal and exploitative sexual relationships between an adult man and a, a teenage boy, which is very common for sure in um, in the Greco-Roman context into which Paul was writing. But, you know, one of the problems with that is that there, there was language for that that Paul right didn't use instead he went straight back and sort of pulled those terms out of leviticus and the languages of a of a man sleeping with another male it's the same word that's used in genesis when god creates humans male and female it doesn't comment on the age of the person it's just like another male is is what's not okay so i think it, it, it's it's often the case i think the christians are hearing an argument which says oh if only you'd read the greek or if only you'd read the hebrew or if only you knew about the cultural context and actually, when you dig into any of these things, you find, no, once I know the Greek, once I know the Hebrew, once I know the cultural context, it's still saying what it looks like it's saying. The Center Church Leaders Podcast is part of the Church Leaders Podcast Network, which is dedicated to resourcing church leaders in order to help them face the complexities of ministry today. The Church Leaders Podcast Network supports pastors and ministry leaders by challenging assumptions, by providing insights and offering practical advice and solutions and steps that will help church leaders navigate the variety of cultures and contexts that we're serving in. Learn more at churchleaders.com slash podcast network. Yeah, I think I think I think it is. A, uh, some people are feeling intimidated in the conversation, and I think mm -hmm. sometimes, like you know, the the casually, flippantly referencing Sodom and Gomorrah uh, is is uh, without you know no, knowing understanding the argument in Romans one is probably not enough in twenty twenty four. And and again, I think that's one of the reasons why your book, Does the Bible Affirm Same Sex Relationships, is going to be helpful for people. Now, again, we've got ten claims. Probably don't have time to go through all of them, but you know, I mean, Jesus never mentions this, so why are you? making this such a big deal. Let's just start there. <laughs> yeah, well, so Jesus in his ministry on earth was predominantly addressing his fellow Jews. And we see occasions when Jesus is interacting with, with Gentiles, but the large majority of time he is talking to his fellow Jews. Um, and then obviously at the end of his ministry on earth, sends his disciples to make disciples of all nations. And then, you know, specifically commissions Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But because the Jews of Jesus' day when, were familiar with the Old Testament law, they were not debating whether it was okay for a man to sleep with another male. That was something that they kind of knew pretty well. Um, it is similarly, Jesus doesn't uh, spend time teaching that you shouldn't worship idols. Now, is that because Jesus doesn't care about idol worship? Not at all. It's, it's patently clear from the Old Testament that God's people should not be worshiping idols. Um, but Jesus doesn't feel the need to to teach on that specifically because he's got, you know, he's got a Jewish audience who already knows that. When it comes to Paul's writings, we see quite a lot of condemnation of idol worship because he's writing often to Gentiles who were coming to Christ out of a context of idol worship. And we see a number of references to same-sex sexual relationships, again, because he's writing to Gentiles in a context where certain kinds of same-sex sexual relationships were seen as perfectly normal and fine and, and good. Now, I think it's an exaggeration to say that Jesus doesn't say anything um, about same-sex sexual relationships for, for two reasons. One is that the Greek word porneia, which is typically translated sexual immorality, was kind of a, a catch-all term for any kind of sexual relationships outside of male-female marriage and absolutely would have included in people's minds um, same-sex sexual relationships in the terms of his day. And, and Jesus specifically contemns porneia um, often ad ad adjacent to condemning adultery. So it's not just, you know, that adultery is not okay, but also any form of sexual immorality is, is not okay. And I find it particularly interesting in terms of our cultural context today that Jesus um, says that sexual immorality is something that might come out of our hearts. 
um, and make us unclean. Because I think one of the arguments or, the, or one of the kind of areas of concern people have today is like, you know, well, since it seems that for some people, you know, myself included, same sex attraction seems to sort of arise in us quite naturally, like that's how it feels. Like, how could you possibly say that something that arises in me so naturally is wrong? Well, the bad news is Jesus says all sorts of things that arise in our hearts seemingly naturally are in fact sinful. So we, we can't come to Christ without recognizing we have a profoundly sinful heart that is going to, like sinful desires are going to come out of my sinful heart and I need Jesus's forgiveness and I need the Spirit's help um, to, to, to resist that. We also in Matthew 19, see Jesus being asked about divorce and once again, giving a kind of stricter version of the law than the, the Old Testament gives um, and defining marriage as um, a one flesh union between one man and one woman. And it's fascinating because Jesus could have only quoted Genesis 2 when he defines marriage, when he says, uh, um, you know, quoting, therefore a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That would have been sufficient to make the point that Jesus was making about um, sort of against divorce. But Jesus actually begins by saying, have you not heard that in the beginning God created them male and female? Coming back to Genesis 1. So it's almost like Jesus is sort of underscoring the male-female nature of marriage um, in a way that wouldn't have been completely necessary to the point that he was making. So yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a misinterpretation of Jesus to say he had nothing to say and that you you know we could um, we could make Jesus's words sort of accommodate same sex sexual relationships, but I think since it is so clear in the Old Testament and in the other New Testament writings that same sex sexual relationships are out of bounds, I think it's an illegitimate read to say, well, Jesus you know clearly wasn't concerned about this because he didn't major on this when he's talking to a different audience. I think this is the uh, the kind of things that people will find helpful in the book. Does the Bible affirm same sex relationships? Because I, I think Rebecca, a lot of people are nervous about how to articulate this, and and uh, and I and I actually tell them they they need to be careful, not just you know get up and regurgitate talking points, but they need, yeah. they need to lean in on the topic. This is an issue of today. And I think clarity is kindness. And, you know, our own church has done a series on where we are in some of these issues and taught what the Bible teaches with, I think, pastoral wisdom and biblical orthodoxy. So you know, what do we just say to people who are like, I just, maybe I should just not talk about this issue at all? I think sometimes people feel um, like they don't want to talk about this issue because it feels like a distraction from the gospel. And it's such a, a barrier to belief. I mean, certainly where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there are so many people who wouldn't even consider Christianity because in their minds it's homophobic. I think actually, if we are talking about Christian sexual ethics in a biblical way, we will find that it is completely centered on the gospel. And so one of the things that I sometimes say to, to non-Christians is, Christian sexual ethics is actually weirder than you think. You know, it's not only that I think that the Bible um, says that sex only belongs in marriage between one man and one, wo one woman, but that actually this is all about a metaphor. And it's, it's a metaphor that we see started in the Old Testament when God is compared by prophet after prophet to a loving, faithful husband and Israel to his often unfaithful wife. Then Jesus comes, sort of steps onto the stage of human history and declares that he is the bridegroom. And it's a very weird comment for a man to make who never married in his life on earth. But actually, if you understand the Old Testament context, it's one of the ways in which Jesus is stepping into the shoes of the creator God revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. You know, he's saying, I am the bridegroom come to claim God's people for myself. And we then see a, a Paul in Ephesians 5 when he describes Christian marriage as like a little sort of scale model of Jesus' love for his people. Um, and, and says at the end of that passage in um, Ephesians 5, 33, that actually the whole point of marriage from the first, you know, he goes back to Genesis 2 and quotes that verse, therefore a man will leave his father and his mother and unite to his wife, two will become one flesh. He says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Um, that we see, oh, actually, just like God has built us um, biologically so that there is a thing called fatherhood <laughs> um, and so that the the absolute best human father can give us a tiny little glimpse of God's fatherly love for us. So God has built us um, in such a way that we can enter into marriage and that we can um, have children in, in that context as well to give us a tiny kind of glimpse of Jesus's exclusive love for us. And we see it then at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation multiple times. Um, it's described as the, the wedding of the lamb. 
as Jesus's marriage to his people brings heaven and earth back together. So actually, I think when we talk about questions of sexual ethics, we need to lean right into the gospel. Because actually, if we're not, we're not really talking about Christian sexual ethics. Like at the center of this conversation is that love that Jesus has for his people. And at the same time, we need to remember that Jesus on the night that he was betrayed said to his disciples, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has known than this that he laid down his life for his friends. And actually, if, if we look through the, the New Testament from soup to nuts, we will find time and again that we are commanded to love one another. You know, we'll find the occasional verse about marriage and the occasional verse about parenting. L- large majority of the time when we're hearing about love in the New Testament, it's God's love for us or it's, it's the brotherly and sisterly love that we are to have for one another. And so rather than as Christians having a sort of shriveled and um, uh, inadequate view of love between believers of the same sex. I actually think we have a beautiful and glorious vision for it. It's just a different vision from the sexual and and romantic kind of exclusive love of marriage. Um, And and again, that's something that I I not only believe from reading the scriptures, but I like see in my life here as, as brothers and sisters sort of learn to love one another and find in the Christian community more love than they ever had when they were seeking their own sexual fulfillment. The, uh, of course, you've written on this in No Greater Love, A Biblical Vision for Friendship. You might not know this, but we originally talked about having you on to talk about that and then found out that your new book was coming out. So I do <laughs> want to commend, again, the book, uh, No Greater Love, A Biblical Vision for Friendship, which I think is really essential to this whole conversation. So um, last question. The reality is you have a significant and generationally growing population that is identifying as LGBTQ+. And so what would you say to pastors and church leaders, our audience, how can they uh, best minister to and disciple people who come to them who express their their own struggle with their sexual identity? What, what would you say? Mm. I would say the harvest is plentiful. And I say that for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that whereas there are some people who, like me, have grown up, you know, all all through adolescence, all through young adulthood, whatever, like I, for whatever reason, um, have always been attracted to their same sex. There is there are also millions of Gen Z women right now who have had exceedingly bad experiences with men. And and again, I have like close friends who've walked this path of basically um, coming to the point of saying, do you know what? I think I must be a lesbian because I find the sexual relationships I've been having with men to have been so awful. The fact is, in in secular culture today, um, and more so than it was 10 or 20 years ago, like the, the sexual revolution as a whole has been exceedingly bad for women. And I've read like non-Christian authors saying this yeah. as well. It's, I'm not even just saying this from a Christian perspective. And the idea that casual sex um, is something that women in general are going to um, want to be made made happy by. It's actually um, demonstrably false on average. What we've introduced in in the last um, several years is a normalization of sexual violence. So for example, we know women being choked by their sexual partners Um, and women are being told, oh, this, you, you should absolutely be in favor of this. Isn't this so great? Actually, it's awful like profoundly terrible. And so we have today millions of young women who are who are dating other women um, as a sort of refuge from the horrors of dating young men. Now, again, I want to be clear, I'm not that 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 is not the story of every young right. woman who identifies as 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 a lesbian or as um as same sex attracted or whatever. Um there are you know plenty of people with more of my story, but that's, I, I do think that explains um, at least some of the, the rapid kind of uptick of, of young women in particular in this situation. Um, and and a, alongside all of this, the, the decline in church attendance over the last 25 years has gone hand in hand with a, a massive upswing in depression, anxiety, suicide attempts, etc., especially among young women. And those are distinctly related things um 
in fact, Harvard School of Public Health has been uh, publishing studies on this. Like it's, we have a a generation in particular, um, Gen Z, that is actually desperate for what we have to offer in the church. Um, and I say that not only because I believe the gospel to be true, which I do, but also just at a purely empirical level. Um, what people need is love, not the kind of sexual culture that they've been pushed into. So that person comes to the pastor, church leader. How do, how do we walk alongside on that journey with them? Um, I think a lot of it is going to be finding people within our congregations who are, who are in a good position to love these young people. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, last Tuesday, for instance, I um, invited a one of the young women in our community group who, um, as a student, started dating another girl and to uh, end up engaged that girl and then while they were engaged, decided like, actually, I can't, I, I just can't go through with this, ended up moving um, to Boston, starting coming to our church, like properly engaged with Christianity in a meaningful way for arguably the first time and um, is now at a point where, you know, she's very seriously following Jesus. Um, I asked her to share her story with a, a young woman who's sort of figuring out what she believes and who um, has herself a, a history of same-sex sexual relationships. Um it, it's finding those people within our communities who can um, empathize with in, in, in the best sense um, and love um, those who, who might be feeling really hurt, um, sometimes by church experiences as well as by what they've experienced sort of outside in the, in the secular world and um, us all growing in our capacity for genuinely um, developing community love. Because even if somebody profoundly disagrees with you, often if they know that you are acting with genuine love towards them, they're actually ready to listen to what you have to say. Um, I say that not least like this morning, I was given a bunch of flowers by the atheist lesbian barista at the, the coffee shop where I routinely work, who we've had all these conversations. <laughs> but she knows that I love her. And so we have a great relationship and we, you know, chat a lot. We give each other thoughtful gifts and I pray for pretty much every day. Thanks for taking time. These are, um, these are not easy conversations, particularly when a culture has overwhelmingly changed its mind on uh, sexuality in the last maybe 15 or 20 years. Uh, but they're important ones. And uh, this is our day. This is our time. So we walk through the moment that we have seeking to be faithful to the scriptures uh, that we love and under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So thanks for taking the time to have the conversation with us. We've been talking to Rebecca McLaughlin. You can learn more about her at RebeccaMcLaughlin.org. Be sure to check out her book, Does the Bible Affirm Same-Sex Relationships? Examining 10 Claims About Scripture and Sexuality. And thanks again for listening to the Sessor Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcasts and through our new podcast network, churchleaders.com slash podcast network. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments, leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.